Why would that be re well? Why would that rel be relevant for them holding the belief? Whether or not they're actually seeing a tree, or no. they're just having, or just just they're just uh, having an illusion of seeing a tree. That's the that's the could, question. That's going to be compatible with them holding the belief that there is a tree. I don't see where justification comes in. No, I'm not just talking about belief. I'm talking about justified true belief. Well, presumably yeah. there's going to be a criterion or a base. Yeah. Yeah, but what is the uh, what's the argument that there is uh, such thing as knowledge then? Then you're just talking about knowledge, not belief, right? Yeah, I'm talking about justified true belief. Yeah, yeah so what's the argument about... that there is such a thing as knowledge? I don't have a basis for um, rejecting. Sorry, I don't really have a basis for rejecting knowledge. Yes, yeah, so it just know. seems so. You can change this. You can just change this argument that you gave here slightly, like, if epistemic error theory is true, then there are no normative epistemic facts. If there are no uh, normative epistemic facts, there are no, uh, there, 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 there is no knowledge, there is no knowledge, uh, and then four, but there is knowledge. You can just switch it to that, to skip all the steps in what we've been gone through, and then the question would just be, what, what evidence is there that there's such thing as knowledge? Do and you also, I, I don't know anything about that, but do you also... Um, reject the property of validity, or do you or do you think that one needs to prove the property of validity? By uh, like logical validity. Yeah. What do you mean if I reject validity or not? Well, could we at least presuppose the idea of validity as being something that exists? No. What's the argument for that? I'm asking. Oh, oh sorry. You, no, no. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't grant that. But like before we go to that, you said when we were discussing this argument that you were running around, right? Uh, I said what, we, you can just take out epistemic merit and demerit and plug in knowledge because you seem to be re because your reasoning seems to be right that uh, if there is no epistemic merit or demerit. Um, then there is no standard for justification, and there is no standard for justification, and there can be no justified true belief. Because how would we uh, distinguish uh, knowledge from mere belief or something along those lines? Yeah. And I said, even if we grant all those steps in that in your reasoning, we can just simplify the argument by taking out epistemic merit and demerit and plugging in knowledge, right? And so it's just going to be that. How are you going to how do you get, how are you going to have a basis of knowledge without merit? No, no. Right. Sure. I mean, that's the point, right? The point is just that to simplify the argument, you can just say that if epistemic error theory is true, then there is no knowledge. There is knowledge, therefore, epistemic error theory is true. But then the question is just going to be, what's the argument that there is knowledge? Right. I it seems pretty silly to me, but okay. Why is that? That's not really an argument. Oh, I'm not saying it's an argument. It just seems no, very, okay. so, I mean, that's... very odd. I just don't know what you do in philosophy without justification or knowledge. Like, yeah, I mean, I just... like, what's the basis of trying to find any truth? Are, are you just saying uh, like... Just, I'm, just like a, I'm, I'm a conventionalist. I just take what justification is. It's just something we decide on as a community arbitrarily and the standards for justification can differ and the same thing goes for validity i don't understand what i don't understand what can how are you going to form a basis for agreement right what criterion are you going to appeal that is going to create the criterion of agreement as opposed to non-agreement right are and you going I, to I, agree I, upon agreement prior to agreement yeah i don't know what that means What's the basis of agreement? How do you know that you're agreeing with the... Uh... I'm sorry, would there have to be rules for you to agree to what the rules of chess are? You're saying that there has to be some non-conventional rule for any agreement upon rules. I'm not sure what the argument for that is. Wait, so what? I've... Hold on. Unless I'm misunderstanding, unless I'm not, like misunderstanding your point. Well, I mean, maybe but I don't just know. To be, but just to be clear, just to be clear, you do not have an yeah. argument for knowledge, right? So your entire episode, so your argument fails there because you can't justify the second premise. I just don't know the alternative. I just don't know what. 
I don't no, know I mean, what like, the philosophy is if if we're uh, not trying to get at like that is that is all it. that is all irrelevant. All philosophy could fail. You agree that you don't have a justification for a second premise. I just agree on that point, and then we can move on. <laughs> I mean, I agree as so far oh, as you okay. know, a skeptic can you know just shit on everything and just say like, okay, well, you know, what is knowledge? What is belief? What is yada yada yada? Sure, I'm just yeah, gonna I mean, make it that knowledge is. I mean, to begin with, I don't even. I believe the concept of knowledge is completely useless. I held Quine's view. But um, going back to justification, I just take justification to be something that is conventionally decided upon. Yeah. So what's the basis? You can decide. You can decide. Uh, how do people agree upon anything like linguistically? I mean, how do you know it's decided upon as to not decided upon? What does that mean? I, I think that, I think there you're going to like. I think there there might be some equivocation on the word no. I think when you're saying how do you know, right, in your question, the ontologist, when you use no there, I think you just mean something like how are you aware of, right? Not that how do you have justified true belief that is the case. Well, I don't, okay, awareness in any sort of viable manner is going to be some sort of self-conscious belief that's propositional. And that's also going to require some sort of like well, presumably propositional content that ha like that's normative. Presumably, those are going to be standards that well, I mean, one that, has to uh, That's a question: whether beliefs are normative or not is going to be a different debate. But even if you grant, but even but even if I grant that to not like open another, to not like sort of like deviate from this discussion, beliefs can be normative. But that's that's going to be completely relevant whether or not there is such a thing as justification, apart from just a conventional standard that we can decide upon. Okay, so look, could I rephrase? How do you distinguish something that is a conventional standard from something that isn't? Well, what do, what would what would something that isn't a conventional standard be? Can you give me an example? Uh, well, presumably, conventional standards are going to be created by a mind, right? A, a mind can't be a matter of convention because. <laughs> conventions are created by minds. No, no, no. That's not the question. He he asked. How do you distinguish between a standard that is uh, conventional or a product of convention from one that isn't? And I asked him, what would it mean in this case? What is a standard? Can you give me an example of a standard that isn't conventional? I mean, that's, that's one way you could phrase it. But what I meant to ask was just uh, how do you distinguish, um, how do you determine for any x, whether x is a conventional standard or x is not a conventional standard. Well, under this view, all standards will be conventional. So I don't so, really understand the question. So, I mean, isn't that just assuming the conclusion? Wait, no, that, no, no, no. If, if, the, if, if a conventionalist, the, sorry, the basis, if a conventionalist, if a conventionalist, conven sorry, hold on. If a conventionalist yeah. holds the view that all standards are conventions. Then if you ask him, well, how do you distinguish those conventions, sorry, how do you distinguish those standards from standards that are not conventional? You're just saying, you're just assuming his belief to be true. So you're, you're the one who's begging the question against the conventionalist and not the other way around I by asking that question. I don't see that, I don't see it. No, but, I, so I'm not talking about, I'm not even assuming that there how, are standards. So, no, you asked, the question you asked was, how do you distinguish between a conventional standard from a non-conventional standard? No, that's not what you... I asked. Oh, okay, sorry, my bad then. What was your question? Is for any X, how do mm -hmm. you decide whether X is or is not a conventional standard? Well, He's I... asking you for a falsification thesis. Wait, what is the, what is, sorry, I'm having a problem understanding the difference between the two questions. So exactly. one assumes that X is a standard. The other mm -hmm. just is asking for anything. How do you mm -hmm. determine whether that thing is a conventional standard or is not a conventional standard? It doesn't have to be the, the, the second, you know, the, dis, the second disjunct doesn't have to be a standard. It could be a, an, it could be a, an elephant. Um, well, a standard is going to be something, is going to be a proposition that is going to be 
some kind of a rule or some kind of a guiding or some kind of a measurement. And so if an object, if I, I'm just trying to understand the question because it sounds kind of bizarre to me. Like if I'm presented with a rock, just in virtue of a rock not being a proposition, I would, I would, I would know that the rock isn't a conventional standard. I just don't understand the question. What is the point of the question? Because I would understand the question, right? If he asked me, well, how do you distinguish between a standard that is conventional and isn't conventional? But as I explained, that would beg the question against my, against my view. But if he's asking for any object, how do you know it's a conventional standard or not? I just don't, I just don't understand where the question is going. Makes sense. I mean, go ahead, whoever was. No, it was just like, it makes sense to me. He's just asking you like the qualifications for how to tell um, a non-conventional statement as opposed to a conventional statements. Like what are the, what are the sort of criterions that you're going to be using in order to qualify that this is a conventional standard? Like what, what, what tools if are you, you going to be using? Like what you, qualification criterion are you going to be using? Wait, do you, do you agree that, so do you agree that like under any view, right? There's going to be a way to distinguish between what is a standard and what isn't a standard, right? And if, if you hold the view that all standards are conventional, how is it that the convention list is required to do some kind of distinguish, uh, to, to distinguish propositions that any other view isn't required, right? Because if I, if you agree that we're able to, if you agree that we're able to distinguish between standards and non-standards, and the view is just that all standards are conventional, then that means that if I'm able to distinguish between uh, standards and non-standards, I'm able to distinguish between conventional standards and non -con and and other things that aren't standards. Well, that might be an argument in itself, saying that certain things like that are vacuous because you have. Because no, that's why that's why I don't understand like his question. No, you have no mutual. Like, you you have nothing to contrast conventional standards. What is the what is the point that like the ontologist is trying to ask is that. Even to do that distinguishing between a conventional standard and, an, and any other object itself is a standard. And that standard itself cannot be conventional. Is that the idea where you're going? I, I was, yeah, trying to head towards uh, something like the principle of, uh, or of, um, of non-contradiction. So like Wait, what? What, the law of non-contradiction. Okay. Right. So we sh we there's no answer to the question should we or shouldn't we believe that question. I'm sorry, believe that law. Believe in that law. Yeah, but there are I don't get the point. I mean there are people who reject there are logic that reject that law. Yeah. Yeah, so what's What's the point you're trying to make? Are you trying um, to critique my view or are you making like, what is? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I guess this is like, I haven't ever encountered uh, epistemic error theory before. I guess it, it could be one of those skeptical challenges that you can't really answer unless you, um, that you can't really answer on the so skeptic's the, own terms. So what's the basis for conventionalism? But do you mean what's the basis for it? Like what's well, the what's justification the, the for it? Is? For pan, what's the basis for a form of pan-conventionalism? Like, how are you arguing for it? You mean, are you asking me to justify the view? Yeah. Um, well, wait, why would I justify the view? I haven't... All I've said is that um, you can be a conventionalist and, ha and speak in terms of, because the point that you brought up, right, just to go back and recapitulate, you said that, well, I gave you here an argument as well, sort of companion. Not, One second, not, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on. Just give me a second. You said that you presented the companions in guilt argument, and then I asked you to justify the second premise. Wait, you I did. did no, you I didn't. gave you the I gave you the existence. Uh, sorry, the epistemic existence premise. I didn't give you the companions and guilt argument. But... Sorry, I said a form of companion and guilt. I don't know whatever 
whatever you want to phrase this as. That it's, argument, just the, uh, it's just known as the epistemic existence okay. premise. Okay, epistemic. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, epistemic existence premise, right? And then we like simplified it to merely a, a two premise argument, right? If epistemic error theory is true, then uh, then there then there is no knowledge. There is knowledge. Therefore, epistemic error theory is right. false. And then mm. I ask you to justify the second premise, and you add, and you consider that you have no justification for it. And then you said, well. Well, how, I could, just, I, how could well hold on? I'm not done yet. And th and then you ask, well, how could we do? How could we do philosophy or any of that if there is no such thing as knowledge? And I said, well, you could, you could, you could have some form of conventionalism where what it means for something to be justified, right, is merely a standard that you agree upon uh, as a community of some sort, right? And philo and you could still do something akin to philosophy and their conventionalism. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and then, it's, an auxiliary, it's an auxiliary question. So what's the basis of... And then, hold on, hold on. And then the ontologist sort of like con kind of confused me with that question, which I didn't understand its relevance. And now we're here. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just, uh, just to kind of avoid the sort of discursive conversation that you're putting me in of where we're going to have to justify things like merits and demerits and validity, which I just take, you know, as maybe... Yeah, but all of those. I'm asking say you, that, like, why, why, why stop the skept, why stop the skepticism there? Why can't I just be skeptical of conventionalism? Why can't I be skeptical of um, beliefs? Why can't I be skeptical of, you know, my left hand? I mean, I don't. Right, who's who's stopping you? The point yeah, is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Are the do point you buy is, into a full skepticism? The the point is right. The point is that if you just give up on knowledge, that the, that by itself is not going to entail that philosophy is impossible. We're still I'm going not, to have to go in whether or not. An auxiliary question. This is. I'm just so, saying. Like, what what basis do you have for anything? Or sorry, why? What's the what's the basis? I hear an echo. Okay. What do you mean? Okay. Sure. What do you mean? Okay. Sure. Just to be, just to, just, be to be, just to be clear. And by the way, someone is echoing. So I like. Hello. Yeah, clear is someone mute clear. Just to be clear that but knowledge by itself being knowledge by itself being impossible, um, it's but that that proposition by itself, it's not clear enough whether or not philosophy is impossible, because conventionalism or I'm not, pragmatism. Not just, just, question. Man. Just let me just let me finish, right? Now your question is, what is the basis for? You're saying, okay, we've given up on this knowledge view. What is the basis for conventionalism or pan-conventionalism or pragmatism? And my question now is, what do you mean by basis? Just something in virtue of which you're justified in those beliefs. What 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 do you mean by justified? If if justified is just something we arbitrarily define, what then it's just a category error to ask a basis for that. What is so you're saying that justification is that's a like form asking of that's like asking that's like asking what's the basis for the rules of chess at that point? The question doesn't make any sense. If if I just take if I just I take think, I don't know if the basis of chess is arbitrary. What do you mean by the uh, the well? What wait wait? You think the rules of chess are somehow like epistemically justified? That it's not merely like something decided by convention? I'm just not sure. <laughs> what? If... No, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> you think you think rules of chess have some kind of an epistemic justification that it wasn't just people who came around and decided on the rules that we're going to have this game and they, they had are the rules for this it's game? Gonna be, there's going to be some sort of explanation, some sort of substantive explanation for why they chose. Yeah, but that's just a causal explanation. That's not a justification. Sure. You could give a well, well, it doesn't necessarily you, have to be a causal you explanation. Asked, it could you be, asked. It could be. Uh -huh. It could be based. It could be based on something else. There's no logical contradiction in it being based upon some sort of. Okay. Okay. Forget. Okay. Basis. Forget. Just. Do you agree that me and you can come together and just arbitrarily decide on a bunch of a rule for a game that we want to play? I don't know if it's going to be arbitrary. Maybe there's an epistemic. Maybe there's going to be some sort of epistemic justification. Maybe it's going to be a causal explanation. I don't. I don't rule if, those out a priori. If. If. Can me and you both have a desire to play a game and in virtue of our desire decide on a set of rules to play a game? Yeah, but then I'm going to have to ask what 
so what is the basis of why desire what, what do you mean by basis i uh, do you mean the cause for what for those desires or are you talking about epistemic justification sometimes you're just using be, you're just be, using the word ground yeah, hold on some basis right. basis i just mean some non-instrumental norm that we're appealing to right because yeah, what is a non instrumental because instrumental norms aren't going to be doing the type of work that's required in order to answer that question because instrumental why, why norms not? why not because instrumental norms only tell us how to accomplish certain types of ends with certain types of means right so okay. let me give you an example okay. by coast coast guard she basically My says that let's assume that we wanted to buy an ice cream cone, right? Um, and presumably it was a penny. Um, and I was presented with a thousand dollars or a penny. Well, there's no substantive reason why I would choose a penny over a thousand dollars right there. Because they both accomplish a certain type of instrumental end. But presumably we do choose between those two. So there is a sort of substantive account. No, I mean I've already I've already addressed this argument before. Yeah, and I don't know if it works. Uh, uh, so uh, even even if even if even if the argument goes through and it doesn't go through because you haven't you haven't explained to me why they couldn't just be some kind of a brute desire that a person has. Uh, but even if we ignore that, all you're gonna get is that the person needs to believe that there is some kind of a categorical norm. That's not going to entail, that's not going to I, entail that there is a categorical norm. Understanding the notion, the ontological notion of what a, of what's needed, right? It's and not, I, this it's is not the same, that. This is the same kind of confusion Kantians make with transcendental arguments that Barry Stroud addressed, right? It could be the case. There's a red herring. No, no, oh, hold on, hold on. I'll, I'll give you the analogy, right? It could be the case, right? that we need to believe a set of beliefs, right? The transcendental categories or whatever, in order to have intelligibility, in order to make sense of experience. But that's not going to entail that those beliefs, the content of those beliefs, the propositions are true of the world, right? Likewise, it could be the case that in order for me to prefer X over Y, uh, that's going to go back to some other preference and that's going to go back to some other preference and it needs to bottom out in something non-instrumental. But that just needs to bottom out in a belief that I have that something is non-instrumentally good or non-instrumentally desirable. But that doesn't buy. That's not going to I entail yeah, that there I is, in fact, your that there is. Sorry. I understand your argument. Okay. I can't make sense of it because it just seems to postulate something that epistemically appears, or something. I'm not even sure if it. If it's, I'm not even sure exactly what the type of nature of this is. That it appears to be such and such without it actually ontologically being what? such and such. Wait, can people are categorical norms true tapped? I'm sorry, what? Are categorical norms true tapped? Um, so what do you what do you mean by that? Just like are they propositions? Uh, maybe yeah. Are they, are they propositions? I tend to think that I tend to think that they are. Well, if you don't think they are, then we can't believe in them, and then your entire argument is going to fail. You have to take them to be propositional. So they well, are. Propositional. We've had this. We've had this. We've had this discussion with TGW Wait. before, and we can take a sort of non-propositional account of intuitions when we look at, say, beliefs of animals. Right? Like, presumably, animals are going to believe certain types of things, and presumably, I didn't they have a conversation with them. I think. I think you've confused me. The only thing I spoke to that guy about was about uh, hinge epistemology and science. I didn't talk to him about animals or intuitions. But That's, anyways, go on. Well, no, it's not just that. You did. Um, you probably just don't remember because the I idea was... Well, the idea was how can we formulate beliefs or how can we have knowledge or justify belief, right? Mm -hmm. And you basically said, well, the only basis of that is going to be some mm -hmm. form of inferentialism because I guess at the time you had a sort of Salarzian picture of it and you know i'm empathetic with that because i'm i really like sellers I, I don't know what it means for a sellers in picture but i hold that all just I, if you're talking about epistemic justification it's going to be inferential i don't know how intuitions are going to be justifiers but anyways go on yeah that's what i mean by oh, okay well mm, 
but Might all of this is like going on a tangent because yeah, but, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. we can solve we can solve all of this with just a simple question. Do you believe that? Do you believe beliefs are propositional or not? Well, I don't know. That's that's exactly why we got into this conversation. So I presumably think like that that's probably going to be the case. But, so okay. So if beliefs are propositional, and you but can hold believe, on. But hold on. Okay. Because there is also the, I forgot what we were initially talking about, because there were cases of where animals seem to believe in something, and it could be the case that, and it's probably the case that they're not thinking of things propositionally, but they seem to have knowledge or justified belief, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're just denying that. About sure. what? No, I mean, I can be agnostic whether or not animals even are agents or even have intentional states. I'm not sure yeah, why that's relevant. Uh, yeah, but uh, there's a kind of about whether or not education, right? Yeah, think it's about a, like a dog who you keep throwing a ball for, and then one time you don't throw the ball, but you make the motion. You know, you you've probably seen someone do this to a dog, and the dog runs after it, right? There's something going on there, um, even if we accept like some account of animal minds where they don't have like propositional right. attitudes, and that's the kind of thing that Marty is getting at. Yeah, but I'm not sure why that would would call, be counted as beliefs, though, because what he is trying to establish is that... Yeah, but then you're be, just playing with words, as TGW said, right? Wait, how am I playing with words? Because then how you're just... Saying, how is saying, if we're defining, if... So, beliefs, uh, I take it to be doxastic attitudes towards propositions. Yeah, if you're, but then, if you're talking, but then if you're we're talking, playing with words of what mean, what... What justification no, is? Just, what no, beliefs, just, what yeah, but the other one. So, you. So we would just be equivocating then. Yeah, sure. But like, I'm not sure how that's an. Yeah, answer. if we would be equivocating in some way, but it looks like right. TGW's point was is that justification or somehow having knowledge like an animal does does have something related to how we have knowledge, right? As in, like, it seems like an open-ended question. You can't just analytically define justification as whatever you wanted to define it as. Look, then you're just talking about something else. I'm talking yeah, about, I'm talking about that that it's an open-ended question. You're, you're so. the, no, it's not because you're the one who ran the argument starting so what do you with... Want to call, what do you want to call animal no, 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 justification? No, 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 don't cut me off. This is, this is incredibly dishonest because you're the one who earlier stipulated that what you're talking about as knowledge is justified true belief okay that's you're the one who's you're the one who stipulated that's the concept of knowledge I five minutes ago about. that i presumably think that this is a good way of talking about it but right. um, so, yeah, but, so but if you're introducing a new be... notion if you're introducing a new notion you got to recognize that you're no longer talking about this topic but now you're talking about a different topic you're just using the same words but you're not talking in the same sense that's not on me. That's on you. You got to clarify how you read terms. <laughs> okay. Because I can't read your mind that you're suddenly using the words in different senses when you stipulated ten minutes ago that what you mean is justify true belief. Okay. So going back to this point that you're talking about now, and by the way, I'm sorry if I kind of sound like uh, I'm shouting or something. It's just how I argue. I just like the Venus comes out when I talk philosophy. But anyways. Um, going back to my point, if you say that categorical norms, if you say that categorical norms are propositional and they're truth apt, right, and people can believe them, then the next question is, are all categorical norms true? If you say to that question, no, some categorical norms are false, right, then that means that people can believe that something is a categorical norm when it does, when it's fact it isn't a categorical norm. They might believe that a categorical norm applies to the world when in fact it doesn't. And that's all I need to demolish the argument that people mm -hmm. might, it might be a requirement, it might be a precondition for mm -hmm. desires that people believe there is some categorical norm that is true of the world. Even, but that's not going to get you that that categorical norm is true of the world, which is what you need to succeed in your argumentation. Yeah, I'm familiar. Right. And you haven't really presented at the theater for that yet. Yeah. And the second, and the second, and the second objection to your argument is why can't people have brute desires? Yeah. I mean, if PSR is false, why can't people have brute desires? Yeah, I understand. 
Right. And this is and this is and this is all operating under some form of physicalism being false because I think under physicalism you're gonna have way more interesting options to play around with around this argument. But since neither of us is a physicalist, um, I'm sorry, did someone move us or is my Discord lagging? No. Someone went live. Okay. But is there is there any anyone else who has like an objection to because it doesn't make sense, just going back to the question that I said earlier, I said, I don't need to justify conventionalism, but it doesn't make sense to ask someone to justify conventionalism because I just, I'm just, i just defining justification as some kind of a rule we as a scientific community or we as philosophers come together and agree upon. So it makes, so it makes as much sense to ask me to justify that as it makes sense to ask someone to justify the rules of chess, right? Yeah, sure. You see how you see how enjoyable this conversation is, Marty. I don't know why you like ban me and don't want to talk to me anymore. Look how much fun we're having. Hey, <laughs> I just I don't have fun after a certain while, man. I'm just get I'm get tired of these arguments. They're the they're the same fucking arguments that I've seen run a billion <laughs> fucking times, man. And it's the same arguments you don't have any replies to. <laughs> Yeah, so you say. Well, what is the reply? <laughs> maybe you can ask Bryn. I'm not going to gonna go can, into another cycle. Maybe, maybe you can tag Bryn in or something. I don't know. I'm interested if there's like a reply. Because to me, it just seems like you make the same mistake the Kantians used to make before Bayer Stroud showed up with, the, with that paper. All uh, right. Oh, Zach is here. Maybe well, Zach can help you out. Let me ask something. Marty, do you think that Venus is being unfair right now in his critique? Um, it depends. <laughs> so by me answering yes, does that mean I have to continue this conversation with you? No, I mean, I don't. I don't. I think I think he m may misunderstand the nature of um, needing to find an explanation for the uh, hypothetical norms. Because the thing is, like, if you don't want to talk to him, you don't need to talk to him. But like, I mean, it sounds like he does have a reasonable critique. Like, do you think? Do you think? Well, the question of whether the critique is mistaken is one thing. But do you think that he is? being unfair because like i i get that you're a little irritated with him being sassy with you but i think also he's irritated with what he perceives as like not conceding when a concession is needed or producing an argument like the way he's looking at it is like you either concede you don't have an argument or you give the argument and then when you don't do that he starts being a dick to you and i i do understand that mind frame but i get that the way you perceive it as the second he goes down that path of like kind of being a dick to you, like you just kind of shut down. But like it sucks because it would be nice to actually reach some kind of agreement. Like, do you think that that's like an unfair assessment of what's going on? Um, I don't know. It's not even. I mean, I think he's being a little bit more reasonable here than he was like in TPC, of where he just like randomly insulted people. I never yeah. ran against other people in TPC. Well, but, let's let's not one sec, yes. Sorry. But it's not even that. It's just like you know. Hey, I don't want to continue on forever with this conversation either. You know, like generally when I say like okay, yeah, I'm like basically done with the conversation. I'm not. I don't know why I would have to continue it. Well. Would I be, let me ask you, Venus, something. Would I be wrong in saying that you're just seeking either the argument or the admission that there isn't an argument? Or am I totally misreading where you're coming from? No, you're, you're reading correctly because we've had, I've had a discussion with Marty before on this exact thing. And I've ran the exact same topic. And after I run the objection, that's when he shuts off. Now, this is the second time he does it. He's, uh... 
it's not so, true. We had just, a conversation afterwards. So. No, no, sorry, about this topic. When we get to this point in the dialectic. No, we continued point. it earlier. We continued it what? earlier. I'm getting no, sucked no, back you're in. You're missing though. you're missing the point that I'm making. Listen up and open your ears and hear. What I what I'm saying is whenever ah, we discuss yes, whenever we discuss yes. this, whenever the we discuss Gustin. this topic I don't know why I'm being cut off. Well whenever we to... discuss this topic whenever we discuss this topic, you present this argument that in order to have desires or preferences, it's going to have to bottom out in something non instrumental. And I make the point with you only need to have the belief. That doesn't mean that the categorical norm is true of the world. And at that point you never have a reply. Well, let's let's just see if we can clear it up. Like so Marty, would you say that at that point you're stumped or would you say that you do have a reply but you're just like annoyed with Venus or something? But I did reply to it. But anyways, if I do reply again, right, we're just going to get into another conversation and ask yourself of which I already told you I'm not interested in. Okay, well, I mean if you if you want to end the conversation, that that's totally fine, but can I I'm like I want maybe maybe if I try to understand like like what? What is the reply that you give to that without without Venus coming in for a second? Like how? how... Seems to misunderstand the nature of what is needed in order to end the infinite regress, right? And so, like presumably, like there's some sort of substantive end for why we choose certain types of instrumental norms, because instrumental norms are just a means to an end. They don't actually tell us why we certainly, oh, sorry, why we're choosing certain types of ends through certain types of means. That's we're going to require an explanation of some sort. Okay. Well, here, one second. So, Venus, the, what you're, are, is what you're trying to do. On, hold on, ask yourself. I've already given a reply to that. And um, he's going to give a reply to that and just saying. And the, just. Yeah, well, and, and, no, head, one second. The explanation for that that I gave him, I gave him, I made two points. One, yes, why does, that, yes, need, did, why yeah. does that need an explanation? Why can't it be brute? And the second, and yeah, and the second is the explanation could be that you believe you believe something is intrinsically good, or you believe in some kind of some some categorical norm or something, and that explains why you have that desires because of that belief. And you've still not explained why that belief by itself is not sufficient for desire. Why it also needs to be true of the world. You keep saying I misunderstand. I misunderstand what is required of the explanation without explaining how there is a misunderstanding. You just merely repeat the claim. Okay. Well, wait. Let's let's see if we can clear it up because I feel like I'm a good neutral third party here. So. The, what is it that we're look, seeking an explanation look, look, ask yourself. I, I hear you. I hear you, by the way. But this is exactly what I don't want to continue with, with Venus. I already said that like five minutes ago. Like, and, I would appreciate it if we just stopped the conversation. It's like already really late for me as it is. Okay, I mean, I'm I'm not going to force you to talk if you don't want to. I mean, all I would say is that my interest is just to understand where where the friction is happening. I guess I'll just ask Venus. You don't have to, you know, say anything well, if you don't want to, Marty. But Venus, my, what sorry, just, what is the thing that that you're seeking an explanation for here? So, so he, what he's saying is that in order for you to have preferences, right? In order to, there needs to be an explanation for why you prefer X over Y, right? And he says that you can either appeal to something, to some other preference, um, uh, but then he's just going to ask a question why you have that preference rather than some other preference. And he says that it's going to bottom out in you believing something is intrinsically good in of itself or something like that, something that is categorical or non-instrumental, right? And what I say is, sure, even if we grant that, why couldn't it bottom out in you believing that something is intrinsically good? Why does that thing actually have to be intrinsically good in a mind-independent way and not just your belief that it is intrinsically good? How does, how does merely your belief, your belief that it's intrinsically good not explain why you have the preferences that you have? And to that, he doesn't have an answer, right? And my hypothesis is, my hypothesis is that he doesn't have a reply, and he's just using a, a, this as an excuse to run away from the discussion. But that's just my hypothesis. But anyways, I'm done speaking.
I'm curious what Zack thinks of the whole thing, if, if Marty doesn't want to fly further. Um, yeah, Zach, do you have a do you have a take from what you've heard so far? I don't really know what's going on. I I got here kind of late. I'm I'm sure Venus can convey it in two seconds. So, you no, know, Venus, what's your? Uh, why don't you give him the just the quick cliff notes? Uh, okay, so Zach, what he's claiming is that for you to prefer one thing over another thing, um, that's gonna need an explanation. And it's all it's gonna bottom out in you in, in something being intrinsically good, right? Um and then the point that I make is even if you grant all that, all that has to be true is that the agent has to believe that it's intrinsically good. It doesn't have to be intrinsically good in a mind independent way, in a way that is true of the world. And the objection that I'm raising is similar to Barry Stroud's objection against Kantian transcendental arguments. Did that did that make it clear? I assume his mic is glitching. Yeah, I saw I saw your you flash on and off there, Zach. Oh, well, I mean, other to other people like Bryn and ask yourself like you understand the point that I'm making, right? Uh, to a degree, I, I want to clear it up. So the the disagreement is about the explanation for having like preference, some given preference. That's the thing yes. that we're disagreeing about. What is the explanation yes. for having the preference? Yes, and, and I'm asking him, why isn't it sufficient for the agent to merely believe that the thing is intrinsically good? Why does it also have to be intrinsically good? Sorry, sorry. So wh what are the options that Marty puts on the table here? Marty is conf uh, Marty's making a confusion. Marty thinks that if the agent... Well, without, without he, ascribing confusion sorry, to it, sorry, like okay. just, just what, thinks, are, what are the... He what is thinks, he... Yeah. He thinks the argument establishes that there's at least one thing in the world that is intrinsically good. Okay, wait, how does that connect to the preference? How, why the explanation for why agents have a given preference? Because he's, because he's asking, why do you prefer X over Y? And then you can appeal to something else like Z or something is the reason why I prefer X over Y, right? For example, um, and and then he's going to ask, well, why do you have that preference? Is it because that pre preference is intrinsically good, or is it because it's a means to something else? If you appeal to the means of something else, it's just going to repeat the question. And his point is that it's going to have to bottom out in something that is good, that is intrinsically good, good in of itself, and not as a means to something else. Okay, so let me just see if I'm understanding. So Marty is saying that we can. So we're, we're asking the question, why do you have a preference for some given thing? Let's just say X. Why do you prefer X? So maybe maybe there's some further preference that explains that, but then we can ask why you have that preference. But like at Correct. some at some kind of like base point, like at the mm -hmm. bo bottom of all these preferences, Marty wants to say that you have this preference because it is is intrinsically good the thing you have a preference for is intrinsically yes. good yes okay. and i'm saying that you only need to think that is that it is intrinsically good or believe that it's intrinsically good in order to get the 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 rest the sort of like the causal chain of other desires and preferences is is it's, believing that it's intrinsically good distinct from just having a preference for it no sorry so, you need to believe that it is intrinsically good because if i tell you for example why do you why do you why do you prefer chocolate over ice cream and you say um because cho uh, ice cream tastes like chocolate ice cream tastes good or something and i ask you why do you have preference for things that taste good or something you're gonna appeal to something else and i can keep asking you ultimately it's gonna bite them out to you saying something and you're just saying something that that because that thing is good in of itself right and then at that point i'm saying the agent just needs to believe that is the case for him to get the other preferences. So let's just say that let's just say that satisfying your taste buds, you believe that satisfying your taste buds is intrinsically good, right? So I so ask I you, um, why do you prefer chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? And you say because it's oh, I think I think bud. I think it all just might have clicked into place. Uh, sorry to cut so you right, off, but so I mean, just, yeah, let me just. Let me just make sure to finish my point and then you sure. respond, right? And yeah. then I tell you, cut, you cut out. Sorry, you cut out, Venus. Then I tell you what? 
Am I cutting? Okay, so let me just start over. So let me ask. So I ask you, why do you prefer chocolate over vanilla? And you say because it's satis it, because it brings more satisfaction to my taste buds, right? Mm -hmm. And then I ask you, why do you want to satis Why do you want to like uh, satisfy your taste buds or whatever? And you tell me because it's intrinsically good to satisfy your taste buds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's th that's what it's gonna bottom out. Yeah. Now what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is all. All that is required for you to have the preference of chocolate over vanilla is that you believe is that you believe that satisfying your taste buds is intrinsically good, not that it is in fact mind independently, objectively true that satisfying your taste buds uh, is an intrinsic good. Do you okay, understand? So, yeah, I think I think I understand, but I think I have a qualm with it. So uh, I, I get I get that you're saying. So we we like say that some given thing is good like we can use another example too like i mean i i think it's good to like help old ladies cross the road and you're like why is that good oh you know because um i think helping old people generally is good okay well why is that good um you know well it increases well-being well why is that good and then at some at some point i let's say it's at the point of it increases well-being i just say mm -hmm. that that is just intrinsically good so that's 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 where it bottoms out for me. I just that's right. like the, as far as I can trace my like chain of preferences down or something. So then so, Marty at that point wants to say that that base thing that you have a preference for has got to be intrinsically good, and you want to say it doesn't have to be intrinsically good. Um, it uh, you could just believe that it's intrinsically good. Yeah, merely believing it's good is an explanation. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's weird because I don't I don't even. Sorry, did someone type out there? I said, can I just um, make a quick comment about that? Yeah, of course, sure. Uh, that uh, Venus's point kind of reminds me of what someone like Bart Strumer would say. So Strumer thinks that it's impossible to have a belief unless you believe that there's at least some reason to have that belief. But if Strumer's view, view is correct, there are no reasons. But, but that doesn't mean that none of us have beliefs, right? Because you only need to have the belief that there are reasons to have beliefs. It doesn't actually have to be the case that there are reasons to have a belief. So similarly, you might right. have a right. preference. You have to believe that at least one thing is intrinsically good. Exactly. But I'm saying that's sufficient to explain the preferences. I, I, there's just one thing that's tripping me out about this. Do you have to have a belief about your preferences to have a preference? Oh, no, but Isaac, I'm being charitable and saying that even if every other premise in his argument is true, oh, if every okay. premise in his if every this is how charitable I am. This is how this is how nice Venus is. I'm saying I'm granting him every single premise in his argument to be true. The only conclusion he's going to get is that you need a belief, not that that thing is going to be intrinsically good. So Can we see argument, how that happens with the other premises? Can, how, how, how exactly are we doing that? So, are, you, are we talking about the, the companions and guilt argument right now? No, no, he's talking about the infinite regress argument. I don't know if it has a name or not. What's the basic uh, idea there? Is it formalized? So, um, no, I don't think it's formalized, but he just ran it earlier. I don't know if he has a name for it or not. But his just idea that it's... If, if you don't want an infinite regress, it's going to have to bottom out that something is intrinsically good. And I'm just an, saying that an it's infinite sufficient... infinite regress for, of... Of beliefs or it's preferences? No, yeah. So he's saying that. So the idea is that in order to prefer A over B, you're gonna have to appeal to something else. Either that thing is gonna be instrumental, and then we can just ask the question again, or it's gonna be categorical. And he's saying that if we agree that we can't just have an infinite regress of instrumental norms, it's gonna have to buy them out in something that is categorical. Okay, I see. So, so, those, so, are the, so those are the premises of the argument. Yeah, so I'm saying just, we can grant all of sure. those. And the only conclusion that you're going to get is that you need to believe that there is something that is intrinsically good. You're not going to get that there is something that is intrinsically good. Okay, yeah, it's it's a little weird when it's not formalized to like think it through. But yeah, so you're you're just granting this whole idea that when we have a preference, you can only have that preference in virtue of having a belief that you know the thing you have a preference for is good. You're you're basically granting that. So then, for any preference. It's got a bottom. There's got to be like a chain of like beliefs that like justify preferences, basically, or that explain. I guess maybe justify is the wrong word. There's got to be a chain of like beliefs that explain preferences, and then right. then somewhere 
at the bottom there's just some belief you have about a thing that's good and you're yes. you're you're just saying it's not clear how it's entailed that that thing actually is intrinsically exactly. good. Exactly. it's not just exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I guess what was weirding me out was just there seemed to be so many other weird assumptions. Like I don't understand why you would have to have like a belief about your preferences in order to like have a preference. Like that alone was enough to like really trip right. me up. But you're just you're just granting well, all of that. When I, when when I when Venus debates, I like to give. I like Can you to not give talk about yourself possible. in the third person. I like to give. I like to give as much as possible and still show their case fails. I like to apply. I, I like to apply the principle of charity on steroids, basically. Uh, so, by the way, Marty apparently wanted to ask me some questions about a view I have. I don't know what the view is. Um, so I don't know if you guys are interested in that or if you would rather continue discussing. Uh, the Issue. Although it seems like there's not going to be much more to discuss unless Marty is willing to uh, explain his objection. Yeah, I don't know uh, going to get anywhere with that. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, okay, come back. I'm not asking change. anyone else, just, just to be clear, Bryn, if he's still here, or ask yourself or Zach, does any of you believe that 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 you having that belief is going to entail that there is an intrinsic thing in the world, or do you not believe that's an entail that entailment follows? So, no, I I, no don't, I I don't see the response to your objection. I I agree that it's a reasonable objection. But no, let's uh, uh, let's 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 move her along though. Zach wants but Venus. To, oh, is well, that, oh, he's sorry. Well, yeah, let's let Marty ask his. Zach says that Marty wants to ask him about something, so let's just... Uh, yeah, okay. I'm just going to mute myself. Let's move along. Well, I mean, you can talk, but I think it's time. Let's drop this topic. We we get what the critique is, and, you know, you can judge for yourself if there's a reply or not, and um, just that's that. But yeah, let's, hear, let's do the next part. So, Marty, what do you want to ask Zach about? Mm -hmm.